Hello and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us this afternoon or this evening, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Monroe Franz and I'm Senior Associate Vice President for Global Engagement and Inclusive Leadership in the Office of Global Inclusion, Diversity and Strategic Innovation here at New York University. We're so very excited to have you join us today for the launch of the Global Black Health Matters Pilot, uh, which is a premiere of unhealthy and healthcare and talk back with the show's cast and producers. So we're very super excited about this today. But before we begin with today's program, I want to let you know that we have closed captioning available. So how can you access that closed, closed captioning? By pressing the live transcript button toward the bottom of your screen. So if you just look down at the bottom of your screen, you can see that live, tran that live transcript button. Press that and you'll be able to access our closed captioning throughout um, the, the entirety of today's program. I will also, so I'll just give you a second to do so. Let's take one moment to do that. All right. And as, as we begin to like today's program, I wanna start by saying that I hope that everyone is um, in places in which you can take care of yourselves, that you're getting support if you need it from members of your community, your family, you know, and so just sending a big shout out to everyone that we wanna make certain that people are continuing to do what you can and finding the support you need during what I know can continue to be difficult times for so many. I would also like to take a moment to honor those who came before us. Um, what some of us call our ancestors and the indigenous peoples whose lands we continue to occupy all across the globe. I want to honor those whose lives have been lost in recent acts of violence, ongoing violence, all throughout different parts of the world, those known to us and those unknown to us who have experienced acts of violence or despair, et cetera, as well as to those whose lives have been lost from a result of lack of access and support through healthcare and med for medical care providers. So please let's all just collectively take a moment in reflection and so we're gonna take a pause of silence. Thank you. So before I introduce our program moderator and the visionary behind this critical project, let me just underscore the importance of this timely conversation for all of us, but especially, of course, for those um, who fall a part of the Black diaspora, for those all around the world that have experienced healthcare inequities, as well as those who are continue, continuing to like, you know, find pathways forward through acts of liberation, through acts of strategy together in collective communities of care, and also to all of the healthcare providers that continue to be supportive and forward thinking in the ways that we create inclusive healthcare practices. Thank you for your labor of love, some of whom we're gonna hear from today. Global Black Health Matters aims to identify pathways to dealing with bias, pathways for us to challenge discrimination and pathways for us to deal with our collective trauma that some of us experience and many of us experience in navigating healthcare and our healthcare needs. I also wanna just like, you know, give a big recognition to those who continue to experience healthcare disparities, but while also being able to advocate for themselves in the midst of these disparities. As we know, despite these inequities, we have been able to persist. Black people all around the world have been able to persist. We continue to have Black people in leadership who've been able to find new ways and innovative ways to continue to find like, you know, solutions to problems that we experience. And so again, just to recognize that today's program is not only about the inequities, but it's also about the strategies and the collective pathways that we find to go forward. So I don't want to stand in front of you any longer between um, the, the launch of like the, tonight, today's, today's program, but I, on behalf of the Office of Global Inclusion and on behalf of Ubiquita Worldwide, whom you're going to hear from the Executive Director very soon of founder, Kim Knox, I would like to express deep gratitude, deep gratitude to everyone that has been involved in this project from the inception of the project to where we are today. And before I turn it over to my dear, dear friend, Kimberly Knox, and the CEO of Ubiquita, the CEO of Ubiquita Worldwide, and again, the brains behind this project and the executive producer of the project, 
want to leave you with this quote um, that this powerful quote, which says from Audre Lorde, which says, caring for myself is not self-indulgence. It is self-preservation. And is not, it is, and that is an act of political warfare. And so with that today, I want to say that I hope we all continue to find ways, as I said earlier, to find self-care, to be in support of community to each other. And again, thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone that's been involved in this project. So turn it over to my dear friend, Kimberly Knox. Wow, thank you so much, Monroe. And thank you, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, <clears throat> Global Black Health Matters, or GBHM, has been a real labor of love. It was something that was really inspired um, by a loss, actually. Um, when I was, when it was 2019, I believe, I, I lost my brother, Sean. And at that time, I had my own challenges with grief, trying to deal and make sense of how someone at his age at 44 could be passing for stage four colon cancer. And it really, I think for me more than anything, kind of put a battery in my back, I guess, around how, why does this keep happening? And over the course, as you know, like by 2020, the pandemic breaks out and I had so many different friends that were passing away, mentors passing away, icons passing away, all look like me barely making their 50th birthday. And I'm like, this is clearly an issue that the pandemic didn't create. The pandemic really just shined a light on something that we've always known that our care isn't the same um, in healthcare systems. And I felt that there might be a way to utilize media to start to shine a light on these stories. We've all gone through different scenarios that have created this long-standing kind of medical mistrust for a lot of people in black and brown communities. And a lot of that is largely due to the various healthcare disparities and our you know, high rates of, of all of these different preventable illnesses. And I think, may, like many of you, I probably grew up believing that, oh, this is all happening because so-and-so runs in my family, but maybe it doesn't run in your family. Maybe your family was also um, victim to all of these different types of factors that work in concert to kind of kill us, unfortunately. So I feel like it was time to kind of use this project to try to do something to shine a light on this and maybe just maybe encourage us to take more agency in our health. Um, so without any further ado, I'd love to present the premiere episode, The Women's Pilot of Global Black Health Matters. Twenty twenty, a mark in time that changed the world. A global pandemic erupts, resulting in the loss of countless lives. COVID nineteen would go on to reveal another lasting and insidious pandemic that both local and global Black and Brown communities have known far too long. Our communities have historically been vulnerable to the ravages of underlying comorbidities, compounded by inequities in healthcare and the economy. In recent years. We have suffered profound and unanticipated losses of so many cultural icons, creatives, social leaders, and influencers. Largely due to many of these same wide-ranging pre-existing conditions or health complications from diabetes, heart disease, or the topic of today's exploration, cancer. GBHM is a platform for the sharing of lived experiences amongst black and brown people navigating inequity in healthcare globally. Through raw, intimate, and vulnerable conversation, we will unpack generational trauma and take back our agency in shifting our personal paths to wellness. Guiding today's discussion is writer, activist, and producer, Michaela Angela Davis. Our resilience and creativity has always fueled us. And by acknowledging our history and harnessing our wisdom, we are reclaiming our well-being.
So I'd love to know, like, literally where you're from and what kind of practices around self-care or health care did you witness as a child from the other Black women in your life, your aunties, your grandmother, whomever, um, or ancestral knowledge that was passed on or perhaps not passed on? So could you just give me a little bit of, of your health history in, in, in relationship to your lineage? Absolutely. So I'm just your ordinary girl from Brooklyn. I didn't grow up in the best neighborhoods. Particularly, mm -hmm. I grew up in neighborhoods where people didn't make it out. You didn't see a lot of mm -hmm. people who mm -hmm. went to college. And it was important for me to really work hard and make something of myself. I am what most people consider a latchkey kid coming home, doing my homework while my mom was really working hard at the hospital to take care of me. And that's sort of what I mm -hmm. saw growing up. My family members, my mom, my dad my aunts, my uncles really working hard. And it was about mm -hmm. making ends meet, making sure mm -hmm. that the bills are paid, making sure that there was food on the table. And they didn't really take the time to prioritize their self-care. And self-care means different things to different individuals. Sure. And for me, it's making sure that I get enough sleep, making sure that I'm eating healthy, making sure that I exercise. Although now mm -hmm. being at home, that's a little bit difficult, but making sure that I get some form of activity, but really taking mm -hmm. some time to just pause and reflect and allow your body to really relax and reset. I think that that's particularly important to unpack a little bit as Black folks, like having this history of caring for others and, and not at the at the detriment of ourselves. But I just want to unpack mm -hmm. that a little bit of this generational servitude in other people's health and health care and prevention and not our own. Historically, what we've seen are our grandparents, our parents really out there working hard for us to yes. make sure that the family stays together, to make sure that the family is taken care of. Another part of that is usually the people that get into health care are in it because they're passionate about caring for mm. others. And that's that's the reason why you want to get into healthcare. But Got a it. lot of the times that comes as sacrifice of yourself. Right. Essentially, you can't take care of anyone else if you don't take care of yourself. So we have to do yes. a better job at doing that. This may be the first generation that's even grappling with that as a notion, right? The, the, mm -hmm. the idea that we're using self-care in our language and that black women really have been the audience that centered and, and uses that language regularly but this is not our grandparents this is not my parents language you wrote a piece i think around um how to prevent childhood obesity and and so this this means you're thinking about how to not do what we have done right how to you know so much of our history black women mm -hmm. are you know if if we have some kind of you know way out of poverty some kind of success and, and i'm and particularly around women i have seen people mm -hmm. go to school get degrees get more degrees get higher degrees work really hard get diabetes get cancer and perish you know in their 50s and 60s and now even earlier i mean i've, I've heard that you know that cancer particularly around black women we're getting we're getting it younger. Um, our mortality rate is the highest of all folks. Like, so can you you talk a little bit about that notion of prevention and and why you talked about childhood obesity? Was it part of that? Was it part of kind of thinking like how do we get ahead of this cycle? If you just drive around your neighborhood, think about what are the things that you see or don't see that impacts our health. So for example, mm. if you drive around your neighborhood, is there a grocery store where you can buy fresh vegetables and fresh fruit? If you drive around your neighborhood, is there a park that you can get outside and, and get some activity in or, or play soccer or football with your children? If you drive around your neighborhood, do you see a lot of doctor's offices? Or is there access to quality of care? So we can't forget mm. those social determinants of health.
child. And if I'm thinking about where I grew up as a child in Brooklyn, there was a deli on every corner. There were lots everywhere. Of, <laughs> right. There were lots of liquor stores. But if I wanted to go and get some fresh cabbage or get some fresh fruit, those places you have to actually travel out of the neighborhood to get to. Mm. So really looking at those social determinants of health. So it was important for mm. me to focus on something that was a huge problem in my community and see what I could do about it. Say for instance, you were already there. You're already living in an underserved um, community. You're already dealing with some health issues. Let's say you, um, mm -hmm. cancer. Is there an equivalent to what you just did, which is a very practical, simple checklist? Are there some things that, that we can do, particularly Black women, Black folks, that they can do, some changes they can make right away to start shifting their, um, the health care in their, in, their, in their own home or in their own communities? I think one of the biggest things that you can do for yourself is advocate for yourself and become well informed. And you have to be very conscious about where you get your information. Of course, you can't believe everything that you read on the internet, but really doing your own research and learning mm -hmm. about your health conditions. I would also say tap into those who are around you, who may have experienced the condition that you have, or some of us have healthcare professionals in their families tap into those individuals. I always tell my students that when they graduate, they are now going to be that go-to person for mm -hmm. all the people in their family because nursing has consistently been rated the most trusted profession. I would also say, get to know your provider. Do your research. Mm -hmm. Look for a doctor that is an expert who's experienced in the condition that you might have or reach out to people mm -hmm. that you might know who can refer a doctor to you, but do your research. I would also say get to know your body. No one knows your body better than you do. And when something doesn't seem right, it's probably because it isn't right. Sometimes when you have a serious illness and maybe you're getting a new diagnosis and that can be a little bit scary, having mm. someone there with you to support you is something that's very beneficial. We've all been home for the past year and a half and it's hard to be really active and get outside, but think about what you can do at home. There's YouTube mm. videos that you can watch and, and do a boot camp. There are other things that you can do while you're in your home to maintain your mm. physical activity. Being very conscious of the foods that you eat. I know with me and, and growing up with family from the South, we love our good Southern comfort foods. And mm -hmm. so thinking about ways that you can make those types of foods that you like healthy, or perhaps you use those types of foods as a treat once a week or twice a week, but it's really going to start with you and you taking control of your health. We also have a history, particularly Black women, of just ignoring pain, just taking pain, just working hard. And also when you have, when you're so stressed out, whether it's environmental, financial, racial Black folks and Black women in particular are holding so much weight. You often are in a state of, of low-grade depression all the time. So to, to be one's own advocate and to, you know, eat healthy and work out, like, of course we want to do that. So the fact that you, you kept adding, ask somebody, have some support, get an advocate. I think that's, that is, I want to take that into consideration that the, mm -hmm. the, the obstacles, historic and current are very real. We didn't grow up seeing mom going out for a jog or we didn't we that's didn't right. grow up seeing dad doing push-ups or lifting weights that's not something that we saw because we're always in survival mode and not to generalize it's really about being conscious of what we've seen and trying mm. to do better I got diagnosed with breast cancer in 2018. And so from 2018 till now, it's been, you know, sort of a mixed bag. And a lot of the feedback that I would get during like my routines would be, 
Miss Santos, you are doing so well. Like, we can't believe that you're reacting this well and your body's so healthy. Natural remedies that were told to me by my uncles, my grandmother, the lineage of like my African ancestry, all of that, that I believe and has helped me stay healthy this long, is totally dismissed. I think mostly it's taught me how resilient I am. I think eight months ago, it was like right before I had um, my ova like ovarian surgery, like ovaries removed, and I was so scared of what that meant. I literally have been grieving my lost children, right? Like yeah. the children that I'll never meet this entire year. So that's been incredibly difficult. Um, my sexuality is non-existent, right? In my queerness too, like I just feel so not related to sex at all. Like I, I just, I'm, asexual right now. I am seeing like a sex therapist and I, you know, I, I do, I'm honoring that part of the process yeah. and that part of the journey. Um, but it, it's, it's really very difficult. If you ask me like, how were you raised? I would say, you know, my family set me up in such a way that I was going to be the most educated, most hardworking, <laughs> most career and goal oriented <laughs> housewife you ever did meet, you know? <laughs> so, you know, when I describe myself, I'm like team too much because mm -hmm. I show up and give 110, 150, 200% to everything that I do. And mm -hmm. it leaves me absolutely exhausted, but I literally don't know any other mm -hmm. way to be because mm -hmm. that's the way I was raised. You know, it mm -hmm. took for me to be sick to say, I need to sit down. I need to rest. My body is exhausted. I don't need another cup of coffee and more carbs. I need a freaking nap. Alexia, that <laughs> was a word. You got it all in. Like the, the over everything, overworking, overachieving, overcoming, over, over. And, you know, yeah. to be as young as you are and say that you're exhausted, that, you know, you may not be in Louisiana or yeah. South Carolina picking cotton, but it's that same feeling of work and over and over and over and over and over and over and be in your exactly. 40s and be exhausted. So the fact that you acknowledged it and voiced it and you have a doctor in front yeah. of your name, but that ritual of overdoing and overworking and overcompensating to overcome is what we're kind of interrogating right now like how do yep. we keep that you know all that over got you over right got you right here with those letters in front of your name and it, like you said it served you well mm -hmm. in your career but at but what did it at what cost why are black women getting cancer mm -hmm. younger why do you think we're dying at a higher rate than everyone else like why is it so dire for black folks and particularly black women and now younger and younger black women yeah so i was diagnosed with breast cancer at 37 years of stress years of eating poorly years of not exercising consistently years mm. of um not getting enough sleep mm. years of being perpetually dehydrated because if i go drink enough water i'm gonna have to go to the bathroom if i have to go to the bathroom in that minute and a half I'm in the bathroom, a patient might walk out the office because they've been waiting too long, or I might miss something, or somebody may think I was somewhere goofing off. You know, it's just, it's stress on top of stress on top of stress. I hope you got a glass of water right next to you. I feel like we all just need to take a toast and have some water just in honor of what you just said. Yes, ma'am. That whether you're a doctor, or whether you're working at Amazon, or whether you're working, you know, in the hospital, we don't stop and have a glass of water. And being perpetually dehydrated can lead to chronic yeah. things, right? And I'm not a doctor, and I I know that that was so that hit me so clearly as as a reality, but also as a metaphor, right? Like as a real practical thing to do, and then also why that is done, and the generations of of black folks that haven't had enough water. I got to show up. I got to perform. I got to kill it. I got to outdo because there's somebody coming behind mm -hmm. me. And mm -hmm. if 
I come in here and, and do poorly or give the idea that I'm lazy, that I'm going to run late, that I don't care if I don't do the most, if I don't do 150% or 200%, like my grandparents and parents mm -hmm. demanded of me, then not only am I not being good enough, I'm ruining it for, you know, the next 10 or 20 coming behind me. And I think we all live with that kind of stress and that kind of yes. responsibility, yes. not just for ourselves, but for our people, for our collective, mm. because we're not viewed in society as individuals. It wouldn't be that Alexia messed up that one time. It would be, we can't take a chance on these these Black residents and trainees because look at what this one did. And while that may not be the truth, that is what we see. It's also what we experience. It is not a notion what you just said. Yeah, so carrying that truth, carrying that weight, carrying that burden um, makes you just push and push and push. And and medicine is, is probably one of the most unhealthy career choices or fields that you could pick because medicine trains you to sacrifice your health and well-being for the health and well-being of ah. everybody else. And the implications of that as a Black person and particularly a black woman where you don't have the social safety net, you probably don't have, you know, some family ready to catch you when right. you collapse and someone, you know, a valet bringing you something to drink. Like, th so th those implications, being a black person and then be being a black woman is exactly. just intense. I've never heard anyone say that, but it makes so much sense. You know, so how did you navigate that and breast cancer and 37? Thankfully, and this may sound weird, but thankfully I had been through some stuff before I got diagnosed with breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And so started doing things like cognitive behavioral therapy very young, um, in my early twenties and then, uh, getting married, uh, subsequently going through a separation and ultimately a divorce. And in the midst of like trying to repair the marriage, we started seeing a therapist. We started seeing a counselor. And when I realized mm. that the marriage was not going to survive, I said, you know what, Miss Lady, I really like you. We have a good rapport. I'm going to mm. need you to help me through this thing. You have been through a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. But the fact that you had some tools and some help and some way to unpack it is really, really notable. I'm so happy for you that not happy because these things happened, yeah. but, but happy because you can be an example now right. of we can get to therapy early. If anybody needs therapy is black folks, you know, yeah. because just, just historical trauma, even if, even if you didn't have current trauma, yeah. there's just trauma, Childhood you know, trauma and so the unpack we have. I don't have time to fall apart. Yeah. I need to heal this so I can get on with my life. And, you know, I had a good solid year of what I thought was good living, you know, making the money, mm -hmm. going to work every day, mm -hmm. you know, being a great mom, being, you know, so active in my daughter's life and doing everything, mm -hmm. you know, showing up to birthday parties and play dates and family events mm -hmm. and building a practice and, um, you know, mm -hmm. doing extracurricular uh, where work was related and academically and all of that kind of stuff. It was doing what I, what I was supposed to be doing, right? Doing mm. all the things that make one look good on paper, but at the cost mm -hmm. of, you know, my internal health and well-being. I didn't recognize it at that time. At what point mm -hmm. do Black folks stop making about their papers, their freedom mm -hmm. papers, their actual paper paper, their, their you know, achievements yeah. to the to the detriment how do you think that the stress all the stress the racial st all the stresses do you think that had do you think the cancer and it is related oh 100 percent. the stress that i lived under for decades prior to my diagnosis mm -hmm. you know stressful undergrad um stressful and undergrad was nothing compared to medical school and residency and then you know waddling out of one training one level of training into another level of training pregnant mm -hmm. um you know just mm -hmm. again having to outperform everybody um having to be your best at all times you know just 
doing everything but taking care of me. To me, that is what manifested a cancer in both of my breasts at 37, as opposed to getting cancer in my mid to late 50s, like my father did, right? right? My cancer diagnosis mm -hmm. preceded his 20 years. Or um, my grandfather, I don't think, had cancer until he was in his mid 70s, you know? And even uh, my grandmother on my mom's side had colon cancer. She didn't have cancer until her um, 60s. So how is it that I got cancer 30 years before my grandparents, 20 plus years mm. before my father did? You know, don't even get me started about, you know, what's in the environment, what's in the water, uh, you yes. know, what yes. kind of air I breathe in my whole childhood, uh, what's happening in the water out here on Long Island where I live, because women here where I live are at an even higher risk of breast cancer than average, regardless of genetic predisposition without being related to one another. I just live in a hot mm. bed of breast cancer. And I thank God mm. that um, I got it at 37 after I had been through some things because if my yeah. 24 or 25 year old self got that cancer, I would not have survived it because I wouldn't have gone mm -hmm. through some of the other things that gave me, um, the resilience that gave me the ability to say, okay, when I went through this and I thought that that was the worst thing that was going to happen to me, here's what worked. Here's how I got over this. I wasn't seeing representation of that in black bodies. And I figured, okay, yes, I'm in the patient's shoes, mm -hmm. but I'm a physician. And if I'm looking for this, there are other women out here looking for this too. I had like this other doctor that like, sort of came in and he was definitely a white Anglo, you know, cis male. Um, and no, not American, I couldn't pinpoint his accent, but he was not American and he was just very like, he said, well, you know, seeing by your genetic code, which is the way that like, that MSK like does their, their targeted cancer treatment is through like your own genetic sequencing. He's like, well, you have African ancestry in you, so your pain threshold is really high. And I was like, it's 2019 and you're saying what now? I feel like it's also hitting like a plateau. Like I'm finally in, re in a recessive sort of state with my cancer and um, everything sort of like on an even keel. I'm dealing well with this line of medication that I'm on um, and the side effects of, you know, asexuality and, you know, painful sex, you know, sexual uh, experiences that just completely put you off to having sex because your body hurts yeah. so it's like those type of things are the things that are now my hurdle mm -hmm. and so I remember in the before time like before the pandemic writing being like maybe I am going to be like an Enoch you know like the spiritual yeah. Yeah. walking on yeah. earth spiritual woman who's mm -hmm. like nurturing to all Mm -hmm. And but I, like as, as a journal entry, right? Like I'm writing in my journal, and yeah. but now I'm like, yeah, maybe this is this is what I am, you know. This notion of home is where. Um, you recharge or where you seek safety, because I think it was very significant mm -hmm. about um, where we feel safe. And I, I, I would contend that there are very few places where black and brown folks and particularly women feel safe, but in this, but in this mm -hmm. quest for safety, right? Go back to when you said um, that your journey recently has been about remembering, because you know, we have, mm -hmm. you know, we have traditions, you know, we, have ways of caring for ourselves. How do you remember? Are, are there yes. a couple of practices? Is there a meditation? Like, are there some practical things that help us get in touch with that internal, instinctive, you know, um, information that may that yeah. ancient information that's in us? So that's one question. And then the second is then how do we make that manifest in our home? What are some practical things that we can do? to help us have healing homes and help us remember. 
whether it was um, purposefully erased from our culture, forbidden, beat out of us, uh, killed for, we were made to forget so much of who we are and our wisdom, the knowing. Um, so it's one of the most rebellious things you can do to be part of the revolution, mm -hmm. to take your place in everything that's going on. And for me and for how I show my clients, there's many ways to activate. The first way is to clear clutter. What is clearing mm -hmm. clutter? Thinking about the music you're listening to, the television that you're ingesting, even the food. Maybe you need to fast a little bit or choose days mm -hmm. for fasting or fast in the morning time. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is just setting that intention also to remember and to be reactivated again. Another way that you can activate yourself is by listening to ancestral sounds. The drum mm -hmm. is the number one thing that if you spend time with the drum and you're listening and literally listening, like not just to the sounds, but to everything, listening to the air, listening to yourself, to your heartbeat, listening to the space that you're sitting is very, very powerful. Um, and being also mindful with your words and the things that you're using, the things that you're putting mm -hmm. out. So all of those things, um, going back to your ancestral places, whether it's mm -hmm. going back down south, whether it's going back mm -hmm. to the Caribbean, where, whether it's mm -hmm. getting on a plane and going back to visit Mama Africa, um, those things are so important, walking barefoot in those spaces, drinking the water from those spaces, talking to the water. These are all really great tools for reactivation. It's interesting because once you do start thinking about it, it gets very present for you, right? Like I'm, yeah. my, my grandparents in particular have been very present with me. So in, 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 in your home, um, yes. what are some simple doable steps or activations or practices to make it, to help one start that transition or transformation into a healing space? We are the home, right? But then your mm -hmm. space as well. So eliminating things like garbage is the easiest. We all have garbage in our homes. Mm. And then also eliminating things that you don't want to have precedence over your world anymore. You know, maybe it's time mm -hmm. to clear out those old bills that you never opened because you were scared to pay the bills back in the day. So you have a whole stash of that in the closet. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you have mm -hmm. things from a past career or a past lover or marriage or life. So as you're clearing, as you're mopping, wiping things down, talking to your space and saying what you want to experience here and what you want to leave your space, your words are so powerful. And hmm. when we move things in the matrix of our home space, when we rearrange, we're, we're setting up things into be, into be a, like a new alignment. That's really interesting. So we, the yeah. globe has been through a toxic experience. We've had loss on a, on a global pandemic level, meaning, you know, the coronavirus and, and everyone has had to like retreat into their spaces, maybe please maybe in a way that they've never had had to be in there before they're living at work they're working at um home you know both of all those things was there anything in particular around covid you know it's it was so disorienting and so full of loss and so full of like like muffled terror what yeah. were the, yeah. what did what could you do in your space especially now we're locked in our spaces you know you know, mm -hmm. maybe the, maybe quarantine is over, but the pandemic isn't over. We're still working no. from home. What, what is, what has been your sort of like COVID yeah. healing, the medicine, like healing for the real, like the med yes, yeah. yes, the medicine package. So with my mm -hmm. clients and those that I help guide, it's creating mm -hmm. that feeling of like, you have everything you need. Now, to begin uh, with, when we had to isolate, when we had to go within, literally go within, mm -hmm. it's very literally. triggering because yes. all of our stuff is uh, staring at us in the face, our physical mm -hmm. stuff and also our spiritual mm -hmm. and emotional stuff. And there's really mm -hmm. nowhere to run. You can't 
you know, go out shopping. You can't like go get brunch and get, you know, mimosa wasted on Sunday. You actually have right. to sit with the uncomfortability. And so for anyone who wants to bring in that medicine package into their space, always cleaning, clean, clean, clean. Like it's the richest thing that we can give ourselves. Mm -hmm. And when we're using water, be active in your conversation with the water. Remember that water is the magic that we have here on earth. So cleaning is not just about cleaning. Cleaning is actually about like reprogramming, refreshing, reviving our space and ourselves. So water is vital. Mm -hmm. We were talking about that in the last segment, not drinking water. Is your home dehydrated? Are you dehydrated? Like what's going is on? Is your home dehydrated? Yes, is your home dehydrated? Your it's true so we have to breathe mm. life into it also plants you know mm. if you have plants you are a never alone okay because you have i'm like looking around I'm like yes you and you life. you you mm. are never alone you have mm -hmm. life around you and they're cleaning your air they're proven to increase productivity they're proven to uh pick up our mood and make us just feel better uh plants are the main main thing and just being creative with your space. I find so many clients and so many mm -hmm. homes that I wind up visiting is that our homes are set up for other people. Mm -hmm. They're set up for when the family comes or when this happens or when that happens. Mm -hmm. But how often do those things really take place? And how much is your home not supporting you and where it is that you are right now? So mm -hmm. be really creative and think, wow, how can my home actually support nap time? How can my home support being a more active lover? How can my home mm -hmm. support my, um, my diet and my exercise? Or how about this? How does my home support my playtime? In playing, we become creative. In playing, we let off steam. In playing, we laugh. In playing, we use our body. All things that we need to do more of. So Rebecca, in dealing with um, your clients, have you, had to work with or have you worked with anyone specifically who was um healing from cancer or having cancer are there are, are there specific things or actions yeah. or intentions um that would be helpful to a cancer patient so i've worked with many people unfortunately that have cancer um, mm -hmm. both in healing the home and we, all of those tips that I already gave can be applied mm -hmm. if you're healing your home from cancer, but as an energy healer, a one-on-one -on -one hands-on practitioner, I've worked with several people that have been surviving cancer, um, in the middle of cancer. And mm -hmm. I think it's so important for people who are going through those things to see someone like me. Um, I think it's so important because we give a different approach to mm -hmm. wellness and to care so when you go to a doctor you're going to get a certain kind of care you're going to get a prescription you're going to get a diagnosis you're going to get all of these yeah. things whereas when you're coming to a practitioner like myself you're going to get hugged you're going to be held mm -hmm. you're going mm -hmm. to experience healing sounds that are are going to reactivate you you're going to feel supported you're going to deal with earth medicine and um things from nature that are here mm. mother earth is here to support us in our healing and so that's where that comes in i've worked with a man who was dealing with breast cancer and i saw him after his last round of chemo and he wrote to me a year later because he doesn't live in new york he wrote to me a year mm. later and said to me gaia is my uh, practitioner um my mama gaia name um, and so he said, Gaia, you know, I, I didn't realize that a year ago I was so close to death when I met you mm. and how much working with you actually brought me back to life. And just talking about how in two years of him dealing with, you know, his cancer, the only time anyone had ever touched him was a doctor or a nurse doing something to him. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. to come and work with me and to feel you know, my, my touch, me holding him, embracing him, seeing him, you know, looking into his eyes, supporting him, touching his mm -hmm. body in a way that lets him know you're safe, you're supported, um, was so powerful for him as a man, as a black man at mm -hmm. that. So we know already 
the numbers, the data, the stories show that black and brown people go through so much being treated in the medical system of today. You can work really in tandem and supporting and yes. filling in the gaps that a medical team, you know, has. Yeah. Another woman that I worked with the day before, the day before she was going to have a double mastectomy, her and her partner came to me to have a ceremony. So that way, when she stepped into her surgery, she was spiritually prepared. Mm -hmm. And she felt Got that. It. Yeah, she felt that this almost like the surgery had already been done. She was only going in tomorrow now for the physical and she left giggling like a teenager. It was really wild to see her come in very defeated and to see her leave, you know, giggling and happy mm. and like feeling really supported. So mm. it's a powerful thing and a privilege to be able to work with people in this way. And it's so scary, you know, to be mm -hmm. sick. Of course. So to yeah. feel like somebody's actually there for you and will be there as you're crying, as you're breathing it out, as you're asking for support, you know, mm -hmm. from a higher power. Um, mm -hmm. it, I think it's just a, a powerful, um, you know, meeting of medicine and spiritual work. I've also been organizing with other chefs and food people here in the city to bring food rescue uh, during COVID. We organized and, more, and mobilized the whole action to do this. Just to say that, you know, 15 or so New York City food people, you know, uh, mobilized an entire city and we were able to do like 90,000 grocery bags, connect farmers with NGOs, like we're doing great work, right? There's such greatness already because the universe is abundant, right? And, and it's abundance. It still allows us when we come into our truth to transmute and catalyze truth to power and the work that we want to do with this initiative to really sort of bring an awareness and a shift of consciousness into what wellness really looks like. Cancer kind of puts a fire under your ass, mm -hmm. right? To like get shit done and like to really be self-actualized and really uh, live your life. I literally stared death in the face when I was going through chemo in this apartment, right? Like this couch was where my bed was, right? Like I, I had nothing here, but from from there to now, I have witnessed a manifestation of like positivity and all of the things I've ever wanted to do are coming true. So I feel like in this healing journey, the power of the mind and the way that your mind, body and spirit co connect are crucial. I think it's my purpose to be chef and to be um, in this food world where we connect everyone mm -hmm. and there's equity built, like baked into the recipe, right? Like yeah. across the board, across the food um, sort of ecosystem. Yeah. So I brought in Chef Gabrielle Hamilton's book, Prune, that features sort of like the menu. I love her as a chef. She is uh, someone I try to emulate. I love the way she cooks. And so I brought this book to like inspire my back of house team and sort of also say, this is kind of the direction that I want to take the culinary program in. And everyone was like super excited. And I have one person on my team who is in her gap year between high school and college. She's 18, graduated during the pandemic in 2020, like just a really cool African-American girl. like just badass she's just really sweet really badass and she's just like trying she's working you know and the other day we were like doing our service you know and running through the ingredients and like working the 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 lunch uh service and she's like i really love hospitality chef and i was like so touched you know and you know we talked about prune and the book and and how gabrielle hamilton's like my I want to emulate her and she's like but chef that's how you are you 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 are in the trenches with us you are you know you this is exactly who you are to me and i was just like exactly very touched but i am 
grateful for my support system and the friends and the community that I have that truly love me, that truly care for me. And without them, I don't know where I would be. I would love to kind of have a conversation with this umbrella of thinking of the intersections that we're in right now. Like we are, we, we are all intersectional, like human beings, obviously. But I want to talk about this intersectional time and specifically as we've been talking about cancer, right? And the intersection of cancer and COVID and racism. Alexia, let me start with you. Like just, just what does that mean that, you know, cancer plus COVID plus racism? Like what's on the other side of that? About a year ago when we were just three months into COVID, um, you know, keeping a close eye on what's happening in the cancer community. I remember reading the statistic that said that there was going to be an excess of 10 to 35,000 colon and breast cancer deaths as a result of COVID. And that was three months in. Wow. That was before anybody could have imagined what the impact was going to be globally, before anybody could have really imagined how it was going to shut down primary mm -hmm. care settings and, and, you know, routine cancer screenings and getting the ability to get a routine mammogram. And mm -hmm. when I was listening to you, you know, ask the question, I was sitting there thinking like how many of those slots when our cancer center was open, um, how many of those slots were prioritized for black and brown mm. people? Mm -hmm. You know, how many providers went out of their way to see to it that black and brown people got the care that they needed? Because, um, you know, on the patient end, I had surgery that was canceled and thank God it was just an elective surgery, but there were um, patients and, and women in the breast cancer community who would have gotten surgery first, who got chemo first, and we're going to find out, did that change anything? Is there going to be a new way to think, you know, rethink um, the stages of treatment? Or are we going to find out five or 10 years from now that may have been to those people's detriment, but it was what we had to do given the circumstances. And so when I think about, you know, the intersection of cancer and COVID and how both of those conditions have disproportionately impacted black and brown people and black and brown communities, you know, I'm saddened to know that probably people who look like us were not prioritized um, in terms of who was getting care, who was going into the operating room, who was getting those coveted slots for, for chemo or radiation or whatever, um, who was the delay of, in treatment more acceptable mm. for, and, you know, who just didn't show up to care because they were so overwhelmed by COVID or because they were an essential employee, like so many of us were, um, mm -hmm. and, and what is going to be the long-term impact. I think that Alexia definitely made some great points. Not only were we dealing with the public health crisis of COVID, but we were also dealing with the public health crisis of social injustice yes. and systemic racism. Yes. And if we look at the numbers, African-Americans make up about 14% of the population, but represent 30% of those who were impacted by COVID. So what I think happened is that COVID really highlighted the impact of structural racism, yeah. as well as highlighted those healthcare disparities and the fact that we need to work harder to combat those disparities. So I'm thinking, I was thinking a lot of things when Alexia was speaking, but really that access to care. Mm -hmm. What are we seeing in our communities of color? And as a nurse and, and a nurse practitioner and a nurse educator and in my different capacities and hats that I wear, one of the things that was really important for me to do was really to work within my community. So as a part of work that I do with outside organizations, one of the things that we've been doing for the last three months going into the community and educating them about COVID, educating them about the importance of vaccinations, because there's certainly hesitancy there, yeah. and rightfully so, yes. because of the historic mistrust of the healthcare system. So I feel like doing my part is going into the community, not only just educating them, but also vaccinating. And so it, it's, it's a process. We all have a part to 
play in this, but COVID certainly highlighted those healthcare disparities and, and made it more mainstream and more people are talking about it and recognizing that these things exist. And I keep thinking about something that Alexia said that is really important. And I don't want it to seem like our burden, but when she said, you know, I had been through some stuff. So I, so by the time I got to cancer, I, I wasn't devastated. And, and I'm thinking about just culturally, we have been through some stuff and we are still here. And how do we not I don't want to be another generation of just like pulling up your bootstraps, like oh, like the over, over, over thing, right? Like, but how do we use that as proof and inspiration that we are more than capable? We are more than resilient. We're not superhuman, but we have some super ancestry and some super rich and a history that. Could, how do we use what we have been through? Because that's that that's the part I was really thinking about, like that I've been through enough and survived and got an education and, and, and. So when something as bad as cancer happened, I had some equipment and some, you know, how do we use our, our history to help our future? This consciousness of being, you know, so resilient as a people. And I think that we need to start reframing some of those words, mm -hmm. those thoughts, those beliefs, because it also leads into, we can take, we have a higher threshold of pain or things don't bother. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, it's, it's again, like dehumanizing us and, and everything and us just even believing these things and it's not self honoring. And we need to go back to the self honoring part. And yes, using the numbers and the data to validate what we've always known, but was very much hidden and using that data and information as um, a reason and, a, and a, you know, giving us kind of the push to be like, you know what, actually, I need to pull back my energy. Actually, I need to reframe and rethink a lot of things for so mm -hmm. long, even with health and wellness, we were made to feel that, um, you know, certain diseases are just passed down. It's like, no, actually, We've been all having these diseases because we've been all been eating the same way. We've been living in food deserts. We haven't had access to, you know, certain fresh foods. So it's not so much hereditary. It's all circumstantial. The foods that we were eating sometimes were survival foods. So again, just like reframing, reclaiming, and remembering all of these things, so important for us to, to step into our healing. How we can recreate to what you were saying, Rebecca, or reframe or define for ourselves for the first time, what is health and wellness? Because the industry of health and wellness does not include us. It's a very sort of like Lululemon, Gwyneth Paltrow looking kind of, you know, situation where we look like outsiders. How do we create our own notions? Because we have it, we have it. How do, how do we tell our own, tell that story and advance that story and share that story. So just understanding that a lot of the things that are being sold to us actually already belong to us. And that's been part of the mind control and the trickery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So going back to that, um, and then communicating, you know, doing your research, understanding like, wow, you know, even for myself as, you know, a woman with Puerto Rican ancestry, understanding how not even that far before me, women were getting sterilized on my island by the United States government, understanding how that affects me today and what I'm going through in my reproductive That's journey right. and fertility journey and all of these things. So going into the history, talking to the elders, we don't even have to go that many far generations back to hear it and to understand it. And then now to understand how we can decolonize, how we can bring take ownership back of our experience now and and make it new rebecca that was that was so powerful and i think we need more platforms like this where we can have open and honest conversation i mean i'm learning so much just hearing from you and you are teaching me things that i didn't know and and this is what we need we need those spaces where we can learn we need those spaces where we can 
have these conversations and learn about our history and incorporate that into our everyday life. So this is this is very powerful and we need more of these safe spaces where we can talk about these things and, and learn about our history. There's a lot more than the paper, right? Than who we are on paper or what our resume says. And the only way to do that is really through connecting and that's cross-generational, that's black and brown, that's cross, you know, it's the diversity of the storytelling, right? But mm -hmm. but with a focus on us, with a focus on us. Just even like we we're saying, taking the the power to um to gather, which is something mm -hmm. that's often been threatened, taking the you know time to gather, sharing that information. People have gone through so much to make sure we didn't do that. So this in itself is part of the revolution. But here we are. Mm -hmm. We're gathered. We're hydrated. I'm going to take a nap <laughs> later. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, I'm going to clean something, wash something with some cute water. You know, like, yes. like you know, not to, but that was, those things feel good too, right? Like, there's also, it's a small thing, but, but a nap or a glass of scented water can can really shift right like how you're how you're seeing things and what what's the next thing that you think you can kind of get through um so in if, if there was any sort of wrap up healing is your birthright mm -hmm. healing is your birthright healing is your birthright and there has never been a better time for you to be self-dedicated to your healing to your rest to refreshing your knowledge, to making space for remembering, and just, again, going back to self-honoring. Are you honoring yourself in how you are taking care of yourself? Um, are you um, putting too much value on what you're giving versus what you're actually living? I would say that it's okay to prioritize yourself, to put yourself before others. I don't think that we've learned that growing up, but it's okay to do that. Self-care isn't selfish. And essentially mm -hmm. you can't take care of anyone else. You can't be the provider for anyone else if you don't take care of yourself. So I'd say check in with yourself daily, put yourself on your to-do list. Think about, well, what did I do today for myself, to make me happy, to make me feel good. You have to prioritize yourself and it is okay. It is okay to do that. Yeah. You know, you know, Selena, I feel every time, whenever I start my day with me first, before I open my phone, before I do anything, and it could be whether I went to the gym, whether I meditated, whether I had that rose water, it's always a better day. If I did my thing mm -hmm. first, and then got to, and that was even when my child was, was young. I didn't do it. I didn't do it as a practice, but now, but now I'm learning not only to put myself on the list, but do me first and then, you know, then pick up the, then get in the boxes. Right? Yeah. So um, important and so powerful what everyone said, and it's all mm -hmm. totally in, interconnected. Um, yes. You know, I was healthy until I was not. But even when I was mm. healthy by medical standards, I didn't have a particular diagnosis or condition. I didn't need a medicine every day. I was very unwell. And so now when I think about, you know, pulling it all together, you know, I always speak from a, a position of um, making sure that I achieve for myself or achieve for my daughter, or my family or my patients that we're all in the state of achieving or working towards total health and wellness because you can just like, you know, when you talk about who you are in the world, you know, what are your stats? How good do you look on paper? I looked good on paper, but if you really mm. got down to how I was living and how I was showing up in the world for myself, cause I was showing up for everybody else. I wasn't showing up for me. I was very unwell. And so, you know, yes, I'm taking care of my health and I'm focused on my health, but I'm also focused on my mind, my mental and emotional state, my body, like physically moving, 
being fit, what I'm feeding my body, how I'm nourishing myself, being hydrated. We keep going back to that, but it's such a big deal. So simple. Um, so and taking, yeah. yeah, but it's so simple that it's just overlooked. It's so simple. It seems unimportant and it is so very important. Um, and central, then taking care yeah. of my spiritual health, you know, mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't necessarily come by the way of just, you know, some set religious practice. Cause I think people think that their spiritual health and wellness ends with that. But for me, my spiritual health means connecting to my ancestors and, mm -hmm. you know, getting the lessons, mm -hmm. um, learned from them, connecting to the earth, the planet, you know, getting down in the soil, getting my feet in the water, those kinds of things. And then, you know, just being in the practices that make me spiritual, spiritually well. So choosing joy, being in the practice of gratitude, uh, praying, meditating which if you mm. kind of think about meditation in a in a in your religious spiritual sense it's mm -hmm. kind of like hearing back from um your higher power right or from mm -hmm. your higher purpose and so mm -hmm. i think in order to be um healthy and well we have to make sure we're inclusive of all of the things that have been mentioned here today i think it's the only way to achieve true health and wellness because cancer or not, I feel healthier than I have been in my previous life because I'm working mm. on my wellness, you know? Wow. We're not one dimensional. Yeah. That distinction between health and wellness is really that you were healthy, but you were not well. And that, and as a cancer survivor, you are more well than before. Like that, that's like a, that's one of those aha moments. And, and it, mm -hmm. and it, and what it does is it illustrates that we can, that we are evolving and that we're evolving and we are healing and we will do it better and faster together. I'm clear with, I am clear of that. Like this, this is what we do. This is what we do. Um, so I'm, I'm just so grateful for this time with all of you. I'm so grateful that we made space for each other and um and that we're hydrated <laughs> that we're that we are <laughs> hydrated that we have set like it's going back to check your basics right is your home hydrated mm -hmm. are you hydrated is your spirit hydrated don't get dried out mm -hmm. so um i thank you and i'm grateful and come on hydrate your life your whole life Welcome back, everybody. I hope you guys just enjoyed our first episode. I definitely just want to take this time to thank our amazing cast, the incomparable Michaela and Angela Davis, uh, Rebecca Hitana Torres, uh, Dr. Selena Gillis, and of course, Dr. Alexia Gaffney Adams. Um, one thing I will say about this show is that our goal is to create a safe space and to have a, a place to include voices from around the world. This was just the first episode, but it is definitely our intention to start to shoot this show and capture it between hubs based between New York, um, London, and South Africa, so that we will have a global team of story producers and having really amazing voices 
coming together to get on this path of wellness. Um, so I just wanted right now to bring on our amazing pan, uh, uh, talkback guests that are going to come and kick it with me right now. And the first person that I am bringing in is a dear friend of mine. We've literally known each other since we were five years old, Dr. Lisa Witty Bradley. And Dr. Lisa Witty Bradley is a plastic and reconstructive surgery specialist. She is also the CEO of Chicks with MDs. And she has more than 23 years of experience and diverse um, with, uh, with a demonstrated history of working in the medical practice industry. Uh, so Lisa, welcome, welcome, welcome. So glad to have you here. Are you there, Lee? Yeah, I'm here. Hey, Kim, first I oh. gotta say congratulations. This was extraordinary, unbelievable. I can't even tell you how many text messages I've been getting. Really? Oh, that's <laughs> like so hashtags, oh my goodness, thank goodness that this is going big. on. Uh, so, you know, just from that feedback, we know that this has been such an essential and critical thing that we need, that people need this type of access and discussion. So congratulations, because you, you've been working on this for years. We've been having this discussion I know. for years. I know. We're going to get into that right now. Let me bring Alexia into the room. So I also am being joined today by a really wonderful, amazing doctor that I had the pleasure of being connected with, maybe at the top of the pandemic, maybe right at like in the beginning of March 2020, um, Dr. Alexia Gaffney Adams, who is a board certified internist at Stony Brook Medical Center and also a breast cancer survivor and contributor of, um, to our pilot, as you saw her sharing with everyone. So Dr. Alexia, welcome and thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on. I mean, this is just a fantastic piece that was produced and we covered it all. Um, a lot of times we separate out, you know, so many aspects of this conversation and we really um, can't be whole and healed and complete without any component of those things. So thank you for, you know, creating this space and creating um, this work is so necessary, so very necessary. Well, thank you so much. I so appreciate you both. And I, I feel like I wanted to just ask you guys a couple of questions, you know, because, you know, we've been on this journey, as you said, like maybe about, I would say what, that's like a year and a half, I think, fully kind of working on this. And I just wanted to ask you guys, as physicians of color, what drew you to lending your voices and expertise to this project? For me, <laughs> so, um, you know, there's but so much reach I can have in the four walls of my office. And in the four, four walls of my office, I am not often taking care of people who look like me. Um, and then there's, I can do what I can do on my own you know, in terms of social media or, um, you know, joining podcasts or other projects. But the fact that this can have um, not just a national reach, but a global reach and, you know, and knowing that my story and what I've learned in, in my lived experience is so much more powerful than what I've learned in, you know, more years than I can count of medical training and three board certifications and, you know, three different fields of expertise, like that plus my story is so much more powerful than those things standing alone. And, you know, I just feel uniquely positioned um, in terms of the education, training, clinical experience and life experience that I have had. And, you know, I have to take that pain and turn it into purpose and and what better way to use those experiences than to um you know lend my voice to this project so i'm so happy to be able to do that awesome awesome lisa what do you have to say about that well you know like we were talking about earlier this we've been having this discussion about health disparities and access and being of service even before the pandemic yeah. Way before and I'm sure everybody on this panel and everybody out there watching, uh, if you have any medical background, people are tapping you as a resource. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have had multiple community members, friends, family 
who go to their physician or healthcare provider and then text me or call me mm -hmm. all of the questions. And why is that happening? Because people don't feel safe mm -hmm. or they are fearful or they're embarrassed or they don't feel that it's a safe environment for them to access certain information. And with the uh, even before the pandemic, we started doing posts you know, about different topics. And then with COVID, it was just like an explosion. People yeah. needed access to resources. Yeah. People weren't able to just do their basic preventive care and taking care of themselves. And it really just exposed cracks in the healthcare system that we already knew were present. Mm -hmm. And so we just wanted to find a way to provide resources, education, and mostly empower people to take control of their health. And that's kind of been echoed over and over again over this hour. Mm -hmm. How can we access things so that we are not just going, we're not just in survival mode all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, that's also part of the reason why we're, it, we're presenting with end stage disease because we're in survival mode. We're taking care of kids. We're taking care of our parents. We're going to work and, and dumping all of our energy onto everybody else and not reserving any for ourselves. So, you know, the goal of all of this is to make us healthier so yeah. that we can enjoy life. Like there's so many of us who we get to the end of our lives and there's no enjoyment. It's just constantly survival. Let me just get enough water so I don't die rather mm -hmm. than being healthy and hydrated, which is what we've been yeah. talking about this whole yeah. hour. So yeah. I just feel like this is so much of a blessing. And I mean, the feedback on my text exchanges, I mean, literally my phone has been blowing up the wow. whole time. So this is so very necessary. So I'm very grateful. Well, wow, that's wonderful to even hear like the feedback that you guys are getting. And I think in general, you would think that these things would be, you know, I can just say for myself, the aha moment about hydration was one of those things that I truly, you know, yeah, you hear, oh, eight glasses of water a day, but you're not necessarily thinking about one, are you even getting that much water, first of all, and two, what happens if you don't, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And I think those kind of simple things are these little inch by inch steps that we can start to take to really shift something. You know, um, which is really the what the show is is actually for and about. Um, so I want to, you know, ask you, Lisa, um, how, you know, you have shared, you know, on socials and definitely, of course, because we're personally friends. You know, your journey, um, health wise, with being diagnosed with a condition, and I just wanted to ask you, like, how has navigating a chronic health condition in your own life informed your empathy for your patients? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, there's a wall and as a physician or a healthcare professional, you're not necessarily aware of it, but you know, when your patients get to you in their appointment, you a lot of people are flustered, they're exhausted, they're mm -hmm. angry. Mm -hmm. And we're, a lot of times you tune that out because you're trying to just keep the machine going. You're trying to get the patients through. You're trying to get that patient to their next care site or whatever has to be done. But there's a wall. And when I was diagnosed with MS in 2013, the, the, the curtain came up, mm -hmm. the wall came down, and I, I felt like I had failed my mm -hmm. patients, because I didn't know all this was going on, the billing issues, mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. scheduling issues, the, the dehumanization of going through getting, getting your studies done, talking to front office staff, talking to your insurance company and being denied or getting surprise billing, not having transportation to sites, mm -hmm. not having the services you require available in your area. Yeah. I mean, I'm in the Chicagoland area, and sometimes I have to drive 30, 45 minutes or an hour, and I have a car. So yeah. what about people who don't, who don't, mm -hmm. who don't have somebody they can get a ride, mm -hmm. who don't have health care shuttle buses to take them, who yeah. kind of fall in that gap between I'm uninsured or insured, and you're mm -hmm. underinsured, so mm -hmm. you don't have access to free transportation. Mm -hmm. You don't have somebody to take care of your kids 
So you can go to your appointments. You can't take off from work because your job says if you take one more afternoon off, we can't guarantee that your position is going to be here. The other thing is that in a 24 month period, my insurance premiums went up fourfold, right? I can absorb that cost. It's painful, <laughs> but I can absorb that cost. Somebody wow. else, their insurance is going to lax. Mm-hmm. And remember, the other thing I do is I educate physicians from a business standpoint. The number one reason for filing bankruptcy in America is healthcare expenses. And so whatever that margin between number one and number two on the reasons to file bankruptcy has Mm -hmm. gone up exponentially since COVID. And the other thing is that we have black folks and brown folks, indigenous folks, all of these marginalized groups have a reason not to trust the system. Mm -hmm. And so how we approach educating people and empowering people is different Mm -hmm. than our colleagues of the majority because we understand that we're living that every day and we know how to talk to folks we know how to get people resources that they need and we also know and i i think i can speak for a lot of folks is that there's a reason why our folks haven't wanted to get vaccinated. And that's because of not just historical disparities, Mm -hmm. but current disparities. You can't tell, you can't limit access or marginalize people and then say, oh, but now we have this vaccine and you really should believe us right now. It doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work like that. So when we started doing these COVID-19 essential videos, it was because we wanted to say, this is the information. Yeah. And then you do what you need to do. But this is the information mm-hmm. and talking to people like you have some sense. Yeah. And that you have respect for folks. It makes a difference. Makes a huge difference. Respect is so key. And I think the reason why we have so much medical mistrust in our communities in general is because a lot of times we're not being treated like we are human beings with sense. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like. Like we're not being treated like that they need to answer our questions. People are just kind of getting pushed along and and that type of thing is causing such a a huge uh, mountain to climb right now, now that we are in, you know, this pen, this valley of a pandemic as it were, you know? So I'm just happy that now we're kind of really dealing with it and calling a thing a thing instead of acting like people are making something up. You know, um, so Dr. Alexia, I wanted to ask you now, what were your experiences at the height of the pandemic that illustrated blatant disparities in care for black and brown patients? I know that in the pilot, I remember you were referencing, you know, just this, uh, this notion that the reality is a lot of slots that were very highly coveted, you know, in cancer centers and stuff like that might not have necessarily been going to people that look like us. And and that is like a real thing that you have to think about. There's so many different ways where bias can come in the way of care. So I just want you to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, just to start with the point of bias, you know, Mm -hmm. I think unintentionally we're sort of taught bias in medical school. You know, we, Mm -hmm. we are taught about the disparate outcomes, but we are not taught the reasoning why. We're not taught about systemic racism. We're not taught about lack of cultural competency. We're not taught that, you know, Black people aren't in clinical trials and maybe they might respond to drugs differently than our white counterparts who were studied. And so, um, you know, the bias is it's, it's just rooted in the practice of medicine and people aren't really cognizant of that. Sure. Um, when we talk about the disparities, you know, I um, returned to hospital care during the, the peak of the first wave of the pandemic and I'm out in suburbia in Long Island and um, our mortality rate, our death rate from COVID-19 was about 15% and in a neighboring healthcare system, it was about 20% for ventilated patients specifically. Mm -hmm. 
in Brooklyn, Queens, Manhattan, the Bronx, it, where it was predominantly Black, Latino, mm -hmm. um, Indigenous people being cared for, the death rate for ICU patients was 80 to 88 percent. You know, when I watched my colleagues, you know, just sharing on social media or just having conversations um, who were on the front lines taking care of people with COVID, you know, they were, you know, not having personal protective equipment, covering their PPE with garbage bags, literally running out of ventilators, running out of mm -hmm. drugs and crash carts, things like that. That was something that um, we did not experience in the healthcare system that I worked in. You know, we had to save masks and reuse them and things like that. But um, there was just a system in place to, to deal with and cut down on, um, you know, lack of equipment. But when you talk about something as simple as, do we have the covering to protect ourselves? Do we have a ventilator to put people on? Imagine what that looks like when you start getting down to the actual medicine and the actual care. You know, mm -hmm. our patients in the community I work and live in had access to clinical trial drugs. We didn't have access to that. My, co my colleagues, my Black colleagues who, you know, stayed home in Brooklyn and Queens and Manhattan and the Bronx to work, they, they weren't doing clinical trials. Their patients weren't even privy or didn't even have access to that. Um, and that is the same for cancer care. You know, I've talked on a number of platforms, been to a number of meetings, conferences, et cetera. How do we close the disparities? And I literally had someone in, in a conference say, well, I wear this button that says, ask me about clinical trials because, you know, just in case I forget. Well, no, not just in case you forget, you should never forget. It should be built into your system so that mm -hmm. nobody forgets. You know, you cannot tell me that wearing a 50 cent snap on button is, 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 is <laughs> breaking the disparity gap. Like, are you <laughs> kidding me? <laughs> this is what you think is acceptable to bring wow. to the table oh to close goodness. the gap. So these are the kinds of things that we are dealing with. These are the kinds of things that we're lending our voices and our, exper our expertise to so that we can really work on closing the disparity gap because that's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to let you think you're doing something for my people by, mm -hmm. by doing that. And by making um, a button. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I, I absolutely agree. I think that that has been such a thing. Like, I, you know, I also grew up with chronic asthma. So I had like just so much experience, um, you know, in and out of the healthcare system and all of the crazy things that happen when you're there and you're not well and you can't really voice what you need because no one's listening to you. So that was really the goal of this show, but we are coming to the end of our time. And I just wanted to thank you guys so much for joining me. I believe Monroe is gonna come back on to kind of give us a, a closing, but I, I just wanted to say thank you to you, Dr. Lisa Whitley Bradley, to you, Dr. Alexia Gaffney Adams, and to everybody, all my entire production team, the Office of Global Inclusion, Diversity and Strategic Innovation, everyone at NYU OGI has been phenomenal. And I definitely want to shout out this uh, NYU School of Global Public Health, as well as uh, Rory, Rory Myers School of Nursing. So they, everyone has been amazing in, in lending their time and their amazing minds to this project. So thank you. So I am just here to say thank you, Dr. Lisa. Thank you, Dr. Alexia. Thank you, Kim. Congratulations. Um, this was truly a village and we did it. Um, and so very, very excited to see this project continue to flourish. This is just the beginning, people, just the beginning. And for those who are able to stick around a little bit longer to hear this amazing talk back, um, like thank you, thank you, thank you. And just collectively, we can do this. I believe strongly in the power of our people. I believe strongly in the power of our ancestors to guide us. And so with that, I wanna just say thank you to everyone. Be well, take care of, continue to take care of yourselves and remember to hydrate. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> take care everyone, bye-bye. Bye guys.